So the brain. The uh, problem with the brain is um, it is uh, really complex enough that it deserves a course all by itself. So what you're going to find, I think, in this chapter is we're really just going to kind of skip along the surface of the brain. Because anytime you try to get into any detail about parts of it, it gets very complicated very fast, as we'll see just a little bit of when we talk about the basal ganglia. So um, use the, the PowerPoint as kind of your study guide. Um, I'm not going to hold you to any, um, well, I'll, we'll do that as we go. Um, I'll just tell you what, when they're up there. OK, so chapter 13. <clears throat> so here it is. Here's the brain. This is what makes us uh, so significantly different from many of the other animals um, on Earth, is we have this big, complex brain that allows us to do all kinds of things. Um, like everything else in anatomy, we divide things up to make it easier to uh, remember, easier to understand. So when we first look at the brain, the mo most of what we see is the cerebrum. So that's this uh, area all up in here. It has, it's very wrinkly. Um, <clears throat> underneath, sitting just underneath and to the back, so this is the front, right? This is the back. Um, we have the cerebellum. And the cerebellum has um, a particular set of uh, functions that we'll talk about later. And then if we were to somehow take the cerebrum off in a way, what we, what we would be left with is this thing right here called the brainstem. So in the very center of the cerebrum, we have what's called the diencephalon. And the diencephalon has the thalamus and the hypothalamus, which we'll talk about the functions of those here in a little while. Um, Moving uh, uh, distally or, or moving towards the tail, um, the diencephalon gives way to the mesencephalon. So that's in green here. And obviously, these colors are not natural. These are just the colors that they've added so you can see what they're talking about. Um, so the mesencephalon, underneath that, we have the pons. Um, the pons is really the attachment of the cerebellum to the rest of the brain, is the pons. And then at the very end, we have the medulla oblongata, um, which is commonly referred to as the brain stem. But technically, the brain stem is the medulla, the pons, and the mesencephalon, so all three things. But the medulla oblongata is um, where a lot of the automatic and autonomic functions are controlled. So it's a key, it's a critical part of the brain because it's where breathing is controlled, it's where blood pressure is controlled. If you have an injury in the medulla oblongata, you're probably going to die um, because the things it does keep you alive, even though they're not particularly complicated. All right. Um, so we have, uh, well, we'll get to the lobes here in a minute. All right. So the brain is not solid. Um, it has empty spaces in it, uh, particularly in the, uh, the cerebrum and the um, uh, uh, brain stem, the medulla. And it has this complex three-dimensional structure here. So we have two kind of horn-shaped lateral ventricles, so one here and one here. When you look at those from the side, they, you, know, you can see that they sort of sweep backwards and to the side. Um, it, it, both of those lateral ventricles empty into a, a, a central ventricle called the third ventricle. And then the third ventricle empties into the fourth. Here's the fourth ventricle down here in the brain stem. And it empties through the aqueduct, or technically the aqueduct of the midbrain is what connects the third ventricle with the fourth. And then um, uh, from the fourth ventricle, um, we get the central canal, which then goes the entire length of the spinal cord. So that central canal is kind of the, the vestige of the um, uh, fourth ventricle that we find in the brain stem. So two laterals, a third, a fourth, an aqueduct in the center. Now normally, in the normal person, the ventricles are all connected. Um, because as we'll see here in a minute, cerebrospinal fluid is created inside of these ventricles. So it has to flow from the inside of the brain to the outside of the brain so that it will be reabsorbed. In the condition called uh, hydrocephalus, which some of you may have heard of, there's a blockage in the flow of CSF from the ventricles into um, uh, the, air, the subarachnoid space on the outside of the brain. And essentially, it causes the brain to swell. 
Um, and in babies, because their skulls are still open, um, they're not, uh, the sutures haven't closed yet, what we'll see is we'll see a head that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as these ventricles enlarge. Now, eventually, that is going to compress the brain up against the inside of the skull, and you'll start getting profound uh, nerve damage if that isn't corrected. So they do um, uh, operate on these ventricles sometimes. Uh, it's one of the bread and butter surgeries of, for neurosurgeons is to shunt or uh, create a way for the CSF to get past the blockage um, that it's encountered. All right. So just like the spinal cord, the brain has the same three layers of connective tissue surrounding it and protecting it. So we have the dura matter, um, the pia matter, or the dura matter, the subarachnoid matter, and then the pia matter. So if we, if we look at the brain here and we zoom into just one little piece, this here is the dura. Now, as you'll see in a minute, parts of the dura in the brain are actually sites of blood vessels called dural sinuses. So in our picture, we actually have dura here and here, and then in between is a sinus, which I'll show you a better picture of in a minute. But then underneath that, here we have the subarachnoid membrane, or the, I'm sorry, the arachnoid membrane, which is right here. And then clinging to the surface of the brain, we have the pia matter, um, uh, which is bound to the uh, surface of the brain by astrocytes. So astrocytes literally hold the pia in place there. And it's in this space right here, underneath the arachnoid membrane, but above the pia matter, this is where you find cerebrospinal fluid, on the outside of the brain. On the inside of the brain, we find it in ventricles, but on the outside of the brain, we find it in this subarachnoid space. And then, um, uh, so that's one space, the subarachnoid space. You'll notice that unlike in the spine, where we had an epidural space, a space outside the dura, but inside the uh, vertebral canal, in the skull, we don't have that. In the normal case, the dura matter is actually um, uh, glued or um, uh, affixed to the inside of the skull. So in the normal case, there is no epidural space. Now you may have heard of an epidural hemorrhage. This is a case where the dura has actually separated from the inside of the skull and is filling with blood, usually arterial blood. It's one of the things that will kill you with a, uh, a closed head injury, you know, like a car accident or a fall from a building or something like that. If you end up with an epidural, you'll probably be dead by the time the ambulance gets there. So it's, uh, if you've heard that epidural word, that's what they're talking about, a, a serious injury that results in bleeding between the dura and the skull. Um, and then the uh, subdura uh, would be underneath the dura, but above the subarachnoid hemorrhage. That's the subdural space. This is a common site for um, venous uh, or veins bleeding into the um, uh, brain. Probably not going to kill you in minutes, but left untreated, it will kill you over days. All right. So the, uh, the dura actually has a three-dimensional shape in the brain. You know, in the spinal cord, it's very simple. It, it just covers everything. Well, in the dura, we have a couple of places where the, the dura has folded in on itself and creates kind of barriers or, or separators from uh, one side of the brain to the next. So um, here in the uh, center, so this is right at the midline, we have what's called the Fox cerebri. Fox just means divider or division. So the Fox cerebri is this thin sheet that, that folds down. And essentially, it separates the left side of the cerebrum from the right side of the cerebrum. So running along the middle, you know, when you see a brain, which you'll see um, in lab uh, either today or, or uh, next week, um, you'll see that the left and right cerebrum are, are very much split. There's a line down the middle. So what sits in that line is this bulk cerebri here. And then the uh, cerebellum, which would be right here, is separated from the cerebrum up here by another sheet of dura called the tentorium cerebelli. So the tentorium separates the cerebrum from the cerebellum. Um, and then uh, at the very back, we have the, the other fox, which is the fox cerebelli, that divides the left side of the cerebellum from the right side of the cerebellum. Okay? And then inside these folds, we have these big blue uh, blood vessels. 
and we call them sinuses. Now, why don't we call them veins? Because veins have um, a, a different kind of wall than these sinuses do. Essentially, the sinuses are just blood flowing through dura. So we have um, a superior sagittal sinus along the top. We have an inferior sagittal sinus along the bottom of the box. Um, and then uh, well, we'll just leave it there for now. You'll, you're going to get some more of this anatomy next semester when you talk about the blood vessels. Um, so you'll revisit the sinuses at that point. All right. All right, so uh, cerebrospinal fluid um, is created inside the brain. <clears throat> you know, we discussed it a little bit um, when we talked about the spinal cord, but this is where we get to really know uh, CSF. So inside the lateral ventricles and the third ventricle, there are areas of choroid. Choroid plexus, it's called. This is um, specialized epithelial cells whose job it is is to produce cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so cerebrospinal fluid is um, it's very much like plasma. You know, uh, blood is a combination of uh, what we call the formed elements, so red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and then um, a, a fluid medium that they float in that we call plasma. Cerebrospinal fluid is a lot like that, the non-cellular component of blood. So it has um, a lot of uh, sodium in it, it has a lot of protein in it, it has a lot of potassium in it. Um, and its role is for three main things. One is to cushion the brain, protect it by cushioning. Anytime you take something fragile and you wrap it in liquid, you're going to have a tendency to protect it. Because as forces come into a liquid, they're distributed evenly across that liquid. So by having the brain surrounded by a fluid, it means blows to the head and things like that, um, don't injure the brain as easily because of that fluid barrier, that fluid buffer. So that's one role. Another is support. Essentially, the brain floats in this cerebrospinal fluid, which means that it doesn't have to be tethered um, as rigidly Instead, it can just kind of float in this fluid, and that way um, uh, uh, it can uh, endure forces a lot better. You know, the brain is exceedingly fragile. So by sitting there and floating, you know, you can imagine floating in a swimming pool, it's harder to hurt somebody who's floating than somebody who's got their feet on the ground. Same thing with the brain. So that's one role. And then the CSF does participate in nutrients and wastes. So it provides nutrients for the brain, and it helps to carry the waste products away from the, the busy neurons. All right. So the CSF is made in here, in the uh, third and lateral ventricles. And then it flows. So it flows from the lateral to the third, which is here. And then from the third, it flows into the fourth. That's through the aqueduct that we talked about a little bit ago. And then uh, from the fourth, there are some openings to the outside of the uh, uh, spinal canal and uh, brain. So this is all inside. And then at the lateral apertures, which are here, now the cerebrospinal fluid enters that subarachnoid space that we talked about before. So it, it travels down the spinal cord. It travels up and around the cerebellum, up and around the cerebrum. But then it has to get reabsorbed. So CSF is being made all the time. So if we're not going to have more and more of it in the brain, which we can't have because we have a confined volume, right? The, the skull is fixed, so we, we have to get rid of the CSF if we're going to make it. And uh, CSF is reabsorbed at these spots right here that are called arachnoid granulations. So it's made at the choroid plexus, travels through the ventricles, out the lateral aperture, then up and around the brain, to be, uh, and it re-enters the bloodstream at these arachnoid granulations. So CSF is in this space right here. And at these granulations, it, it goes up and into the blood that's in the sinuses. So um, it comes out of the blood in the choroid, and it goes back into the blood at these arachnoid uh, granulations. All right. So CSF, cushioning, support, and transport of nu uh, nutrients and wastes. All right. So, in all these labels, what do you need to know off of this? You should know the, the lateral ventricle, the third ventricle, the aqueduct for sure, the fourth ventricle, the lateral aperture, um, and then these arachnoid granulations. 
Uh, but the rest of this uh, stuff, will be either we picked up other places or isn't important to know. All right. So the blood-brain barrier. We talked a little bit about this when we talked about um, the glial cells, the neuroglia, um, and the role that the astrocytes have in creating a barrier between the blood and the brain. <clears throat> well, there's a, a little more to the story than that. So here are the in blue are those feet processes of the astrocytes that are wrapping around the capillaries and preventing, controlling uh, the, the movement of substances from inside this capillary here into the brain. Another important component is that the capillaries themselves are a little different. Normally in the body, um, between capillary cells, like, like right here, you see there's, this is one cell and this is another because there's a line right here. Normally, substances can pass between cells like that. So um, uh, nutrient molecules, um, large uh, uh, proteins and things like that can squeeze through the space between the, the endothelial cells, which make this up. In the brain, they, don't, they can't um, because we have those tight junctions or occluding junctions, which we talked about a long time ago now in this class. But... Um, they are like uh, a sewing stitch, you know, so they, um, they block the passage of materials between these two cells. So if we were to zoom in on this uh, barrier or border between this cell and this cell, we would see that it's, these cell membranes have been locked together so that stuff cannot sneak through. So that's another aspect. So we have the astrocyte feet, and then we have the occluding junctions between the endothelial cells that um, restrict what can pass through. So if you can't get between the cells, that means you have to go through them. And in order to go through an endothelial cell, you're gonna need a receptor, a channel, something on the membrane to allow substances to pass from here to in here. So it gives the, the brain and the capillaries of the brain control over what enters the brain. Important because the brain is super fragile. Neurons are very, very fragile there. They're killed very easily by toxins. So this blood-brain barrier helps to prevent those toxins that could be circulating from actually getting into the brain in the first place. All right. Okay. All right, so we start our tour of the brain at the bottom, so at the medulla oblongata. So down here is the spinal cord, and really all the medulla oblongata is is uh, an extension of the spinal cord that is starting to get bigger around. So um, the medulla oblongata ends where the spinal cord begins. Um, <clears throat> it's the site of cardiovascular regulation. Now the heart beats all by itself. You know, the heart doesn't have to be told by the brain to beat. You know, you'll learn next semester that the heart is autorhythmic. In other words, it will beat all by itself as long as it has oxygen and uh, uh, nutrients to do so. However, the heart is regulated by the nervous system. Um, it's turned up, it's turned down, that's the autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. So the site of the brain's regulation of the heart is here in the medulla oblongata. So an injury to these areas, to these cardiovascular centers, um, would result in a, a drop in blood pressure or wide swings in blood pressure, wide swings in heart rate, that kind of thing. And then the respiratory pacemaker is also in the medulla oblongata. So the heart beats all by itself. The diaphragm does not. The diaphragm is just a normal skeletal muscle. So without a periodic stimulus from the brain, the diaphragm won't contract and breathing will cease. So the primary respiratory pacemaker um, is critical for the pulmonary side of, of uh, keeping oxygen levels high and carbon dioxide levels low. So there again, damage to the medulla oblongata might kill you um, because of respiratory failure. You know, no signal to breathe means no breathing. All right. Now, uh, you do not need to know any of this anatomy. All I want you to know is this stuff up here. You know, the med uh, medulla um, is continuous with the cord, and it has these uh, important um, functions built in there. Now what this uh, anatomy is showing you is we actually know where, like which part of the medulla oblongata does these various things, but that's beyond what you all need to know. All right. 
So moving up, so here's the medulla oblongata here. So the next part of the brain up is in blue, and that's the pons. Um, so the pons uh, uh, connects the cerebellum with the rest of the brain. And it's sort of unique in the brain stem because it has fibers that go transverse. You know, if you look at the general pattern here, the fibers kind of run this way, right? In the pons, they run in the plane into the screen. So they, they run across the front. You know, they, they run across like this, even though most of the fibers are going like this. Um, so we see these transverse fibers. It's the easiest way to identify the pons, you know, if you're holding a brain or if you're looking at a picture. If it has transverse fibers, that's the pons. Um, and it kind of wraps around uh, to connect to the cerebellum. The pons, similar to the medulla oblongata, also has important respiratory centers in it. Now, it's not the pacemaker, it's more of um, the, uh, the conductor. Um, so the medulla oblongata sends a signal to the diaphragm to breathe. The pons kind of tells the diaphragm how to do that. In other words, how to make a breath nice and slow, or how to make a breath uh, fast and deep. The pons modulates that signal that's being sent to the diaphragm to make things smoother and, and more elegant, so to speak, uh, for the uh, diaphragm. Um, and then the pons has, because of its location between the cerebrum up here and, and the spinal cord down here, all of these areas of the brain have important information passing through them. So like the sensory information from all the uh, skin receptors, it passes through the medulla oblongata, the pons, the midbrain, and up to the thalamus. All the motor commands from the cerebrum also have to pass through these structures, too. So not only do they have their unique roles, um, but they're also uh, uh, things pass through them. You know, so damage to the medulla oblongata uh, can also knock out sensation and, and motion, causing paralysis for all the levels below it. Um, same with all of these others. All right, so tracks that pass through. Uh, here again, you do not need to know this anatomy. We're, I treat the brain in this class more conceptually than anatomically. I don't think it's important for you to be able to label all these diagrams. It doesn't matter. Know what the pons does and some general things about it. Transverse fibers connects the cerebellum to the rest of the uh, brain. All right. So what about the cerebellum? The cerebellum is my favorite part of the brain. And the reason for that is... Uh, because of this first thing that it can do. So we've all had the experience, anybody who drives, which is probably all of you, you know, that you've, you've uh, been driving for quite some time and you, know, you get to your final destination and you haven't really thought about driving very much, even though you somehow, you've got the car from point A to point B, but you didn't really think about the driving. That's because the cerebellum can drive the car for you. The reason for that is it essentially stores recipes for, for commonly done things. You know, for example, like driving a car. Um, instead of, it has learned by paying attention to the rep repetitive actions over the past, how to do those things for the cerebrum. Um, similar, you know, like uh, signing your name is another one. You don't have to think about it, and that's because the cerebellum has remembered how you sign your name, and it can do that whenever it's asked to. So um, uh, common tasks, patterns of muscular activity, and it's at the subconscious level. You know, the cerebellum doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't contribute to our consciousness, but it does allow us to automate things, so to speak. So we can, so the rest of the brain can think about something else um, while the cerebellum is, is managing the body or managing the activity. All right, so that's one important role, the recipes. Another is posture. Um, so... You know, the human being standing upright has a lot of postural um, corrections to make. You know, every time uh, you take a step or your body position changes, um, the, the muscles have to adapt so you don't fall over. Even sitting down, you know, in order to hold the head up above the shoulders instead of drooping, falling asleep, um, the cerebellum is managing all those muscles of posture as well. Um, and then... Uh, Balance is another key component. Um, the cerebellum is preferentially affected by alcohol, for example. So one of the reasons that people who have had too much to drink stumble and lose their balance is because the cerebellum has been turned down 
and it can just show you the kinds of things the cerebellum is doing all the time, which is to, uh, to make our actions nice and smooth, to keep us in balance, to keep us stable, all those things. All right, so there's uh, balance and posture. And then programming and fine tuning. It turns out that the signals from the cerebrum are not very fine and calculated. But what the cerebellum does is it takes the signals from the cerebrum and smooths them out, cleans them up, makes them very precise and very um, uh, accurate. So, you know, the reason that uh, you can, uh, you know, toss a ball into a, a basket is because the cerebellum has taken that task from the uh, cerebrum and, and, and made it perfected it, essentially made it smoother, made it more accurate, accurate, made it more coordinated. All right. So the cerebellum can get damaged in a variety of ways, trauma to the back of the head, stroke, and then many uh, uh, drugs and alcohol can directly affect uh, the cerebellum. And typically they all result in the same thing, and that's ataxia. Ataxia just means difficulty walking because of, of uh, a uh, lack of balance or control or coordination, you know, like the drunk person. All right, so cerebellum. <clears throat> okay, so going back to the brain stem, the next one up is the mesencephalon. This is called the midbrain. Called that because it's sort of in the middle. It's, it's between the diencephalon, which is at the top, and the pons at the bottom. Um, uh, the most striking feature of the midbrain are these four, you know, semi-spherical nodules that stick out um, uh, uh, towards the back. Those are called colliculi. So we have two superior colliculi and we have two inferior colliculi, and they do different things. So the superior colliculi are all about vision. So they, they take visual input from the eyes and they use that input to control the, uh, the uh, position of the eyes and head. Um, so, uh, let's see, how, how do you describe this? You know, when you're walking, you have kind of a lateral motion, at least most people do. But you're, you, the, uh, your view of the world doesn't bob like that, like you see in movies sometimes. And the reason for that is because the superior colliculi are controlling the movements of the eyes and the head to keep your vision stable even as your body moves. So um, it's sort of uh, audio or visual muscular coordination. All right. It, the uh, inferior colliculi does that, but does it with auditory information. So if somebody behind you and to the left says your name, even quite quietly, what do you do? You know, you turn and look, right? That's your inferior colliculi. It's orienting your head and eyes towards an auditory stimulus. So we have superior and inferior colliculi. And then the other uh, <clears throat> important thing that your book places in the uh, midbrain is the <laughs> RAS, the reticular activating system. Now, this system actually goes all the way through the brainstem. So the medulla, the pons, and the midbrain all have components of the reticular activating system. So why should you care? All right, the RAS is what decides or determines the level of wakefulness of the cerebrum. So whether you're awake, asleep, or somewhere in between, it's the RAS that makes that determination. So like in the morning when you wake up, it's the reticular activating system that basically turns everything on. You know, turns the cerebrum on, not that it's ever off, but it, it gets it awake so that you can function during the day. And then at night, it's the RAS that determines uh, sleep. You know, so as you're uh, laying in bed, going to sleep, the RAS is turning things off, so to speak, um, so that the brain can go to sleep. So it's a critical component of the brain simply because wakefulness is necessary for consciousness, right? And for intellect and for emotion and all those other things. So a problem with the reticular activating system affects everything else. Um, because uh, if you're not awake, you're not going to be able to do all the things that the brain can do. So illnesses like narcolepsy um, affect the reticular activating system. Um, people who have extreme difficulty uh, waking up, again, that's the reticular activating system not functioning properly. Thankfully, for most people, um, the RAS works just fine. All right. And alarm clocks wake us up. Okay, so now we get up to the, uh, the diencephalon. 
I always think of this as kind of the center of the brain. And it, it, because geometrically, it kind of is. It's at the very center of the big massive cerebrum. The cerebellum is just under it. So if you were to circle the center of the brain, what you'd end up circling is this diencephalon. And it consists of three parts. Um, the epithalamus, which hardly anybody ever talks about, um, uh, contains the pineal gland. The pineal gland is um, a gland, it's right here, um, uh, that produces melatonin. And um, we don't exactly know what melatonin does, but we know that it plays a role in circadian rhythm. You know, in other words, your sleep-wake cycle. Um, but we don't know how that happens or exactly uh, uh, what the physiology there is. We just know it produces melatonin. All right, so that's the epithalamus here. And then the other two parts are the thalamus and uh, the hypothalamus, which we'll talk about in just in a second. The thalamus is a kind of intelligent relay station for um, the brain. You know, you can imagine that you have, um, you know, lots of sensation of touch. You have, uh, there's a lot, our eyes are very good, so we pick up a lot of details in our environment. Our ears are decent, so we're hearing things all the time. If we paid attention to every stimulus that is coming into the body, we, that's all we would be able to do. You know, it would, it would drive you crazy if you, if you had to listen or hear all of those things. So what the thalamus does is it takes all that stimulus from the outside world and it chooses what to send on and what not to send on. Um, so, uh, in other words, send up to the cerebrum, as we'll see in a minute, because it's the cerebrum where consciousness really is. So, for example, you know, the, uh, the shoes on your feet create sensation on your feet. And you didn't think about that until I just brought it up because the thalamus was blocking that information. It wasn't sending it on to the brain because, you know, you're listening to me, you're not thinking about your feet. So that's the kind of intelligent relay that the thalamus does. It's sort of a switchboard that sends important stimuli to the brain for processing while ignoring all the extraneous stimuli that aren't important. All right. So in many ways, I think it's one of the most important parts of the brain. Because if you had to think about every little stimulus that your nervous system is creating, um, it would just literally be maddening. All right. So then the other part of the diencephalon is the hypothalamus. And it's in charge of a lot of really important stuff. Um, temperature control, the autonomic nervous system, in other words, blood pressure, heart rate, it shares this role with the um, medulla oblongata. The best way to think about it is the medulla keeps you alive. The hypothalamus keeps you appropriate. In other words, um, is your blood pressure where it needs to be to fight or flee? You know, the medulla is just going to make sure it's adequate. It's not going to match it to what is going on in your life. So the hypothalamus is the intelligent control of these things that are necessary for life. So uh, temperature, autonomic hormones, uh, when we get to chapter 18, um, which I believe is where A and P2 will start it's in chapter 18. Um, <clears throat> we'll see that the hypothalamus is the control center for all the hormone systems. So thyroid, um, the uh, reproductive hormones, um, they all come from the hypothalamus. And then hunger, thirst, and circadian rhythm or sleep-wake cycle. So the hypothalamus is a very low-level control, but a lot of really important stuff there. All right. So inside the, so now we've come up to the cerebrum, and while we're going to spend most of our time talking about this out, outermost part of the cerebrum, just um, uh, after the diencephalon in the middle, the next layer out is this right here, and that's what we call the limbic system. So the limbic system is more of a functional grouping than an anatomical one. In other words, you can point at parts of it, but the limbic system as, as a functional thing has uh, these commonalities. So the limbic system is responsible for things like emotions, um, memory storage and retrieval, creating memories and accessing those memories to do you know, intelligent things. That's all limbic system. Um, it connects intellectual function with autonomic function. Okay, well, what does that mean? It means that when you see a big bear with its teeth bared uh, coming at you, that's an intellectual event. 
You know, you had to notice the bear, figure out what it's doing, realize that you're in danger, right? Well, then the limbic system takes that analysis and creates a fear response out of it so that you're ready to fight or flee from the bear. So it links those two things. Um, for those of you that have had a psychology class or two, you know that people talk about motivations. Well, we think that the, the limbic system is our motivational center. In other words, why do we do the things we do? Well, the limbic system has goals and drives and, and motivations that create those activities. You know, why are you all in this classroom right now? Because you want to succeed in your life and you want to, you know, you want to do well. Well, that comes out of the limbic system is that the motivations and desires. All right. And then uh, wanting and learning. In other words, you know, wanting is uh, 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 developing um, a, a task or a need. And learning is storing up memory in an intelligent way. And those things also um, come from the limbic system. So one way to think about the brain is that the limbic system is the older brain. You know, if you look at lizards and uh, 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 birds and simpler animals, they have a limbic system. They just don't have this big cerebrum surrounding it. So um, the limbic system is an, an older, more primitive, instinct-driven, uh, uh, reactionary part of the brain um, that for us is just part of what the brain does. But for the, some of the lower animals, that's it. That's all they've got. Is So they're driven by these wants and motivations and memory and things like that. All right, so that's the limbic system. Again, you do not need to know any of this anatomy. Just know this stuff, what the limbic system is responsible for. All right. Um, so then, now going out further, between the limbic system and the cerebral cortex, uh, we have the basal nuclei. So a nuclei is a cluster of nerve cell bodies found inside the CNS or in, inside the brain. Similar to a ganglia in the peripheral nervous system is the same thing outside of the CNS. So we call these groups of cell bodies nuclei. Um, and in the deep cerebrum, we have this set of nuclei that we call the, the basal nuclei. And they are uh, they're critical for motor activity. Um, so it's, you can call it subconscious motor control. So here's what I mean. If you decide to get up and walk across the room, you know, your conscious decision was to stand and move to a point in space, right? Well, it's the basal nuclei that actually gets you there. In other words, put foot in front, shift weight. Put second foot in front, shift weight. That actually do the motions that move your body to the other side of the room. So the basal nuclei work in the unconscious or the subconscious but they bridge that gap between decision and actual fact of having moved your body one step at a time across the room to where you want to go. All right. So uh, they're important in initiating and terminating movements. Um, so in Parkinson's disease, for example, the basal nuclei are affected, and these patients have a difficult time starting any motion. Once they get moving, they're fine. They can walk without, a, you know, without much of a problem. But they have difficulty beginning actions because the basal nuclei are being affected. Ending actions are the same thing. Um, uh, it's, once a patient with a basal nuclei problem gets started doing something, they have a tendency to continue doing it even when they want to stop. So like walking across the campus, they would keep walking when they wanted to stop because the basal nuclei can't stop that action that started. All right. <clears throat> so they manage repeating patterns of motion in learned activities, you know, like walking, like riding a bicycle, um, uh, even things like writing. Um, the basal nuclei are handling all the details. You know, the, the cerebral cortex is deciding what to write, but it's the basal nuclei that's moving the muscles of the hand to make that action occur. All right. Um, so we hear about problems with these in Parkinson's disease, um, uh, which you'll learn more about later, and then also in strokes. Um, because of the position of the basal nuclei in the brain, their blood supply is not tremendous. So anytime there's an insult to that blood supply, like with a stroke, the basal nuclei are often affected because of that position. They're sort of between the two circulations to the brain that you'll learn more about later.
All right. So here again, you do not have to know any of this anatomy because at least on this slide, I don't know this stuff either. So <laughs> you guys don't need to either. All right. <clears throat> and we kind of already covered this, but your book sort of gives an example of what these basal nuclei do. You know, so uh, remember our model that receptors create stimuli. There's interneurons that process that stimuli to create an action, right? Well, we've added a little detail here. So um, uh, receptors bring information into the brain, and then uh, the cerebral cortex decides what to do with that information, what the response is going to be. Once it does, it sends the signal not directly to the muscles, but to the basal nuclei, and then the basal nuclei control the muscles to do all the things, all the, all the parts of that action required to accomplish it. So, um, <clears throat> and then as that's happening, the motor areas of the cortex are sort of monitoring everything to make sure that the action is proceeding as expected. And if it's not, then the cerebral cortex can intervene and adjust what the basal nuclei are doing. So, um, <clears throat> so they give you some examples like, uh, you know, the brain decides to start walking and stop walking, but it's the basal nuclei that actually make the walking happen. All right. So we'll do a few questions here. All right. In the uh, central nervous system, clusters of gray matter containing cell bodies are called which of those things? Oh, wait. My, uh... I have to reset my Wi-Fi. Hold on a second. There we go. There's everybody. All right. There. Now you should get the question. Sorry for the delay. Jump in there. I'm going to close it in a second. All right, we got kind of a split between A and E, which isn't surprising because both A and E are clusters of cell bodies. Ganglia are clusters of cell bodies found outside the central nervous system. So like the dorsal root ganglia that's found um, just before the spinal nerve, that is outside the CNS, so we call it a ganglia. A nuclei is in the uh, brain or spinal cord. Um, so like the basal nuclei that we were just talking about, those are found inside the cerebrum, so they're called uh, nuclei, not ganglia. All right. Which of the following is correctly associated with the medulla oblongata? if you're going to tick tock, tick tock. All right, so the correct answer there is B. Um, the medulla has nuclei for blood pressure control. That's blood vessel diameter. You'll learn that next semester that blood pressure is controlled by changing the diameter of the blood vessels as well as heart rate. So A gives rise to conscious thoughts. Only the cerebrum is responsible for consciousness, you know, for uh, uh, thoughts that we're aware of. Um, the uh, cerebral peduncles, that's from the uh, midbrain. 
Um, the most superior portion of the brain stem, um, you'd call that the pons. Um, and then relaying sensory information, that would be the thalamus. All right. So most sensory input that ascends through the spinal cord and brain stem project to the what? So where does the sensory information go before it gets to the cerebrum? Jump in there. Two, one, zero. Okay, correct answer here is C, the thalamus. The thalamus receives sensory input from practically everywhere that has sensory input to send to the brain. Um, and the reason for that is so that it can act as that intelligent switchboard, sending some stimuli up to the cerebral cortex to create conscious awareness but blocking a lot of stimuli so that we're not overwhelmed by our own senses all the time. All right, we'll stop for there or there for uh, today. We'll pick up on Wednesday. Thank you, everyone.